So, are there really black holes? Well, to answer that question, we have to understand what you mean when you say a black hole. Mm -hmm. And as with many of these things that we talk about, we're going to have to go back, back through time, back to, again, the early 1900s and the work of uh, Einstein in developing his general theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. So as we've seen, this is a new way, or it's 100 years old now, but a new way of talking about gravity, how we understand how gravity operates in the universe. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things is when Einstein developed uh, his general theory of relativity, there's, there's two parts, right? There's one part which you know famously is that matter tells space-time how to bend, mm -hmm. and then the second part is space-time tells matter how to move. And so we sort of have two bits of mathematics we need to worry about. For the first of those, matter tells space-time how to bend, we have something called the Einstein field equations. And you can write them down, it's only one line, mm -hmm. but the way they're written, it hides a lot of mathematics behind it. And Einstein felt that his equations were horrendous. Okay, So what essentially he, he felt was that even if we could mathematically describe how matter and energy is laid out to solve those equations and work out how space and time should be distorted around that mass and energy, mm -hmm. is too difficult uh, a mathematical problem to solve. Uh, this is when the name associated with black holes enters onto the stage, and this is Carl Schwarzschild. Mm -hmm. So what did he do? So this was 1916. World War One was raging, and Carl Schwarzschild was on the Eastern Front. Uh, he was, uh, you uh -huh. know, facing the Russians. Um, as with all wars, when well, wars are meant to be this, uh, you know, hours of of boredom punctuated by these moments of complete terror. He had plenty of time on his hands, and he did mathematics. And he was very interested in this work done by Einstein. And he asked himself the question, well, what would the space-time look, look like around a spherical mass? Okay, so he did what we often do with mathematical equations, is you choose some assumptions to make the problem easier. Mm -hmm. So he assumed spherical symmetry. You take a spherical mass, you should get a spherical gravitational field. Mm -hmm. And that reduces the complexity of um, Einstein's equations. Now, they're not simple to solve, we get, but we do set this as a, a problem for our fourth-year honor students here at the University of Sydney. In any sort of a class on uh, general relativity, you could say work out the Schwarzschild solution, which is the gravitational field outside of a spherical mass distribution. So what does this field look like? Well, it's... Uh, it's as it suggests it's spherical in shape mm -hmm. and what you get is that the gravity gets stronger and stronger the closer and closer you get to the surface of your spherical object mm -hmm. things get interesting when you start to make your sphere smaller and smaller and smaller so you keep the mass the same mm -hmm. okay so you're making your object denser and denser and denser and you find that your gravitational field your space-time curvature gets stronger and stronger and stronger and what Schwarzschild did is consider what happens in the limit, right? Take the size of your object down to zero, and you get that your gravitational field gets infinitely strong effectively at the center. Mm -hmm. But he found out there were these other weird things, that there was a point which is now known as the Schwarzschild horizon, is that once your mass is within that radius, then no forces that we know can prevent complete collapse down to a point. So this is kind of the point of no return that's so famous. So yes. one way to, of measuring how strong is a gravitational field is to say, all right, how fast would I have to shoot something for it to get away from this field? Yeah. So the, the, the Schwarzschild radius around the event horizon, it, around the black hole, sorry, is where you would need to go at the speed of light to get away. Yes, yeah, in, in hand-wavy terms. But it, it, it is that boundary that light cannot escape from... So any light within the Schwarzschild horizon can't get out. It's destined to be at the center. Right. So what happens if I'm, I'm, I'm falling into the black hole, heaven forbid, ah. but I at least point my torch out of the black hole, 
what happens to that light? Well, as um, here's your event horizon. As you're falling in, the light will be able to escape, but because it has to climb out of the gravitational field, it gets more and more redshifted. Mm -hmm. So if you start off with a blue torch light, somebody receiving it will see initially blue and then into red and then infrared and radio waves. Mm -hmm. As you cross the horizon, then the light rays that you're sending outwards start falling inwards with you mm -hmm. so it, it, they can't escape so anybody looking from the outside actually will see see you fall through the event horizon but your image will be basically frozen it'll be that last look as you <laughs> as you cross the event horizon you might they, as well make it dramatic yeah. of course yeah and then they will not receive any light from inside the event horizon as and then you're, you're doomed you're going right. to end up in the, the center of the black hole as is your torch as is your torch but of course the important thing is is that this is a theoretical object we're talking about, yeah. right? So um, Einstein did his work, and again, as we mentioned, gravitational waves. Einstein struggled a bit to see, to understand if the, the Schwarzschild solution was a physical solution or something to do with the coordinates. And again, it's one of those already messy places in terms of relativity. It's one of the simplest solutions, mm -hmm. but messiest to understand, right? So people were interested in black holes from a theoretical viewpoint from a theoretical curiosity through the you know 20s 30s 40s and into the 50s but into the 60s people started to ask the question do black holes physically exist in the universe are there things that are described by this theory and this is this when um people discovered these very active objects in the universe the quasars which you know a lot about oh absolutely so the wonderful thing about quasars was uh, they it, when you turn on a radio telescope, when you turn on any sort of new type of telescope, you're never entirely sure what you're going to see. So in the 60s, radio telescopes, 50s and 60s, radio telescopes get turned on for the first time. So there's a whole bunch of electrical engineers who learned how to do radio in the war and now want to look at the sky. And they find very bright sources of uh, radio waves, very compact sources, so it looks like a single point out in the sky and they're wondering what on earth those things are because stars most most stars don't really put off gravitational waves uh, sorry radio waves and through through a bit of ingenuity they find out actually these are very small very point-like objects that are an awfully long way away they have very large red shifts so if those are coming from expansion then they're a long way away so that tells you two things you've got a point source right you've got a very small object but it's a long way away so it must be extremely bright if we can see it from here. So how on earth do you make something bright, yep. that bright, so that we could see it from here? And there's a whole heap of ideas that now start coming out in the 60s. Maybe they are uh, supermassive stars. So maybe they're sort of 10,000, a million times the mass of the sun. You know, it's, it's hard to model that sort of thing because they're a pretty crazy kind of system. But one of the things that, that doesn't quite work for that model of how what these things are is that, um, well, two things. One, this, this type of star wouldn't last very long. It'll just burn through its fuel extremely quickly, probably in a million years or so. And the other thing is that quasars flicker. If you watch uh, these very bright objects, their brightness isn't totally constant. They, it will go up and down over a fairly short time scale. And it's hard to make an enormous star flicker like that. It, while it lasts, it'll be fairly constant. So they needed some other theory about how these things work and one of the, of the ideas that really uh, started to take hold which was going to explain all the data in the 1960s was this idea that it's it's matter falling into a supermassive black hole. Oh, we should note actually of course that uh, Donald Lyndon Bell recently died yes. and he was an astronomer at the University of Cambridge and he was one of the first to propose that the source of the energy in these very active objects is gravitational. It's gravitational energy. Essentially what's happening is things are falling in strong gravitational fields. They hit other things and that causes them to heat up and glow and that you get this disk of matter orbiting whatever the source of this very strong gravitational field is. Mm -hmm. And these objects have to be so small that the only thing that fits the bill is that they are black holes. Mm -hmm. So these are disks of superheated matter with more matter raining down and keeping the disk hot mm. orbiting around a massive black hole so it's somewhat indirect evidence but it's sort of like the only way that we can find an efficient power source that will allow us to to, to get that much energy out of a small volume and to make it flicker because if you just make if your fuel source, you know, for whatever you know, things are just flying around and flying into black holes if it if it cuts off 
for a short amount of time, then your quasar will dim for a mm-hmm. short amount of time. And that's a way you can easily make this kind of idea, this kind of uh, system flicker up and down in, in brightness, and it's hard to do any other way. Yeah. Okay, do we have any more... Uh, you know, direct evidence that these are how quasar works. Well, quasars work. Uh, I, some of the cool observations are to do with uh, observations with radio telescopes. So, uh, not radio, X-ray telescopes. <laughs> wrong, wrong end of the spectrum. X-ray telescopes. So, uh, the Earth's atmosphere um, it protects us from X-rays from space, so they get mm-hmm. absorbed. So, if you want to observe the universe in X-rays, you need to get a telescope above the atmosphere. So, mm-hmm. there's some famous telescopes that. Um, were put in orbit uh, over the last few decades, and they looked out into the universe at um, at X-ray wavelengths. Mm-hmm. So those telescopes, they looked at these quasars, and what they could see was the emission of radiation from ion atoms. Mm. Now, these ion atoms are in these accretion disks, which are whizzing around at high speeds, it's so hot that they've lost a whole bunch of their electrons. So you see an ionized iron. That tells you the kind of conditions that we're in. Yeah. Very, very hot environments. Now, the material that's going around the center of this black hole is actually moving at speeds appreciable to the speed of light. It's you know, a reasonable large fraction of the speed of light. Mm-hmm. They're whizzing around, and so we have to worry about relativistic effects. But there's not only that, the, the light that gets emitted by these ion atoms also has to climb out of the very strong gravitational field of the black hole that it's orbiting. Mm-hmm. And you can actually calculate what the signature, what the shape of the emission from these ion atoms will look like. And this, it's precisely what we see. We see this very distorted line that reveals not only the mass of the black hole, mm-hmm. but also how fast it's spinning. Mm. which is the other key feature you can get for black holes is that they can spin. So again, somewhat indirect evidence, but what we've got is that the signature is precisely what you'd expect if the source of this intense gravitational field is a black hole. Right, one of the really important other things we can do with a black hole is is the nearest big one to us is at the centre of our galaxy. And what you what we've been doing since sort of 1995 is astronomers looking very... Uh, closely, very hard and very high resolution at where we think the black hole is. There's a source of radio waves there. We think we know where it is. To to not so much see the black hole itself, because it's black, but to see what happens to the things that are around the black hole. And one of the great things that you can see, and uh, we'll get a video up on as I speak, is that if you watch the way stars move, every now and then a star will wander close to the place where we think the black hole is and do a complete U-turn in its direction in about a month. So these are these are stars. These are enormous, uh, you know, collections of matter. They're you know the size of the sun, of course. But whatever's there can make that whole thing just do a complete U-turn in its direction in about a month. And you can see loads of stars just coming in, uh, approaching this apparently blank bit of the sky and then they just do a complete u-turn as if there is something very massive there and thanks to the way you know we can understand how how gravity would make things move we can get a good idea on how much mass there needs to be inside the orbit of that star as it swings past in order to have it you know have the effect on the stars that it does and we're at the point where there's no known form of matter that could stop that amount of stuff in that smaller region from totally collapsing in on itself. Yeah, yeah. So it, it must be a black hole. This this year is very exciting because one of these stars, S2, because give them all pretty... So cool. exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually going to be on its closest approach to the black hole, which is known as Sag A, Sagittarius mm-hmm. A. Uh, and there are a bunch of telescopes that are going to be watching this star and watching its motion as it goes around, because it'll be getting very close to the black hole. And uh, there's a group using the Keck telescope in Hawaii. They've been doing these long-term observations, but there's also this very accurate instrument that's been developed by the European Southern Observatory called Gravity, which is also going to map out the motion of this star. And what they're looking for, of course, is how well does the orbit match an orbit you'd expect in Einstein's Mm -hmm. general theory of relativity? The expectation, of course, is is that it's going to match perfectly, right? And again, that would be a um, a vindication that Einstein's gravity is a correct uh, description. Mm -hmm. But what they really want to see is that a slight distortion. If it's not quite, then this might be hinting that gravity as we know it is something beyond what Einstein wrote down. 
mm. which would which itself would be very interesting give us ideas about where we go next with our our theories of gravity the hope is i mean for me the hope is that sooner or later one of these stars uh rather than just sort of swinging out past the outskirts really gets in close to the point where maybe it gets ripped apart or maybe it gets distorted or something like that and i um i think uh, that we're on sort of tens of years, sort of decade scale. We'll have to wait that long. We just keep watching. But sooner or later, one of these stars, because they're randomly buzzing around, one of these stars is really going to find itself in a lot of trouble. Yep. And we're going to be a, 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 in the hot seat watching what goes on. Yep. So we have that to look forward to. Absolutely. And there are some gas clouds floating around in the centre that have uh, gotten yeah. close in the past. So... Um, yeah, the centre of the galaxy this year is going to be a big year for the centre of the galaxy and the black hole there. Mm-hmm. But I think there's one more thing to mention with regards to whether or not you know there are really black holes. Mm-hmm. And we've already spoken about gravitational waves. Okay, so we already spoke about the signature as detected by LIGO. And as you mentioned, the signature that you see is a particular kind of chirp. There's a particular sort of uh, way the waves come through, and that chirp, the theory is calculated from. Um, basically taking the mathematics we know for black holes and crashing two black holes together and calculating the chirp. Mm -hmm. The signature, the chirp, the details of that chirp depend upon what is creating the gravitational field. Mm. So a very dense object like a neutron star produces a different signature to a completely collapsed object like a black hole. And what the LIGO results showed was that this particular kind of chirp, where you get this rise in frequency, and then you get this thing called the ring down afterwards. That ring down is what happens when black holes merge. It's when their event horizons, their Schwarzschild horizons, basically merge together and settle down to be in a final event horizon. Mm-hmm. As far as we know, that signature perfectly matches our expectation of what a black hole should do. Now, of course, observations with LIGO in the future might show something different. Mm. But at the moment, our observations are pointing to black holes being real. 